Hey, did you know that Alzheimer's is one of the leading causes of death in the United States? Alzheimer's and dementia are really scary because they affect your brain and they start decades before you start to see any symptoms. On this podcast, I interview an MD, a medical doctor, an absolute expert in Alzheimer's disease who's co-authored 400 medical articles and written multiple books on Alzheimer's. And he shares how you can take preventative measures now to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's for yourself. In addition, he also shares a very important connection between Alzheimer's and heart disease, which allows us to use new and unique ways for preventing Alzheimer's. Take a listen to this amazing podcast. If you're looking to get thicker, fuller, and stronger hair, make sure to check out fullyvital.com. The team has come up with four unique ways to stimulate the hair follicles to get them to start regrowing again. So to get thicker and fuller and stronger hair using vegan and 100% natural products, go to fullyvital.com and use the code ANTIAGINGHACKS for 15% off. Are you enjoying the videos on this channel? Then make sure to hit the subscribe button down below so you can get notified when we release new episodes. Our goal on this channel is to help you look and feel younger and also reverse your aging so that you can live your best life. So make sure to hit the subscribe button down below so you can get notified when we release new episodes. With that said, let's get right on with the podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Anti-Aging Hacks podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Marvan Saba, who is a board-certified neurologist and geriatric neurologist and is one of the nation's leading experts in Alzheimer's and dementia and has been interviewed by AARP, NPR, Bloomberg, the Wall Street Journal, Prevention, and other national media. Dr. Sabah is the author of The Alzheimer's Answer, The Alzheimer's Prevention Handbook, and co-author of Fighting for My Life. His current book is titled Strong Heart, Sharp Mind, and is published in 2022. Dr. Sabai is a leading investigator for many prominent national Alzheimer's treatment trials. Dr. Sabai is on the editorial board for F- Journal of Alzheimer's Disease and Alzheimer's and Dementia TRCI. He is editor-in-chief of Neurology and Therapy. He has authored and co-authored over 400 medical and scientific articles on Alzheimer's research. He's been recognized with numerous awards and is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology since 2004. Wow, what a great resume. Thank you, Dr. Khan. With that said, welcome to the Anti-Aging Hacks podcast, Dr. Sabah. Thank you for having me. Okay, great. I have a lot of questions for you. I've been reading your book, which is very well written, and it kind of opened my mind up to some new ideas and some new developments that we have, specifically with Alzheimer's and how it relates to the heart. So before we get right into it, tell the listeners about your background and how you came from a family of doctors and how you chose Alzheimer's to focus on. That's uh, thank you for that. Uh, I, I do come from a family of doctors. Uh, my father's a surgeon, my uncle's a neurosurgeon, my wife is family physician. So uh, kind of, it was almost inevitable that I would be a physician, although I knew I was pre-med by the age of eight. I just loved uh, medicine and uh, loved the brain. And I went to college pre-med and then uh, went to medical school knowing I was going to do something with the brain. And between neurology and neurosurgery, I found neurology much, much more interesting than neurosurgery. And that's how I got into it. I got into Alzheimer's because I started doing research in college and I had a fear of getting old. And I thought, you know, what can, what can I do to prevent, uh, you know, what I consider to be the sad and destructive elements of aging, which is Alzheimer's. How do we prevent those changes from occurring? And I've devoted my entire career uh, over 30 years, 35 years to Alzheimer's and research. Yeah, that's evidenced by your 400 published articles and multiple books. So congratulations on an amazing Thank career. You. And hope, we hope that you do this for the next 40, 60 years and keep going. There you um, go. Yeah. So your book is called, Dr. Sabah, it's called Strong Heart, Sharp Mind. Why did you choose to focus on a connection between the brain and the heart? Why was that important? Yeah, so this started out because um, uh, the first, the co-author, Joe Piscatella, uh, who uh, he is, we wrote, co-wrote the book together. He had a heart attack at age 38 mm-hmm. and he uh, had bypass surgery right about the t- same time. And the surgeon apparently told him, you're not going to live to see 40. And he knew that he had to make radical changes in his life. And that's over 30 years ago. He's in well into his seventies now. And so he became a strong advocate and best-selling author around heart health. And he realized that their link between heart health and brain health needs something to be explored. And that's how we got together 
and wrote a book on the heart health, brain health. And so keeping your heart well, you get a two for one benefit of helping them heart, improve heart health and brain health at the same time. Uh, and so there's obviously you found a connection through scientific research and uh, yes. yourselves looking into this. What is that connection between the heart and the brain? And and is this a very new information, meaning in the last, last few years, or has this been known for a long time? It has been known, but uh, the information has certainly increased in the last few years. So, you know, a lot of people would never assume that there's any connection between the heart and brain. And more importantly, they would assume it's all related to circulation. And the answer is no, it's not a circulation issue. There are mechanistic overlaps. For example, there is now very clear evidence that uh, aggressive blood pressure management is going to protect the heart and the brain to the point where we consider aggressive blood pressure management one of the three recommendations we would give for prevention uh, out for brain health, for prevention of Alzheimer's disease. The data wow. is that good. So hypertension is a known risk factor for heart disease. And it turns out that protecting against hypertension lowers the risk for developing Alzheimer's. That's number one. Number two is we know that homocysteine, a blood protein, when elevated, increases risk, risk for strokes, heart attacks, and memory loss. And I know that, Faraz, you probably spent a lot of time talking about homocysteine because we know that is a, a blood protein can cause all kinds of health problems as, as we go along. And mm -hmm. we can reduce that by taking vitamin B supplementation, particularly B9 and B12. We mm -hmm. know that the increased risk for homocysteine when it's elevated, for sure you can have a heart attack and it can actually cause memory loss. The third thing we understand is the risk factor is the APOE, the apolipoprotein E genotype. We know that your genetic risk, that increase your risk for Alzheimer's also happens to increase your risk for heart disease. In fact, most people do not realize that that genetic risk, a blood test, was first found in heart disease and then later found for heart Alzheimer's disease. So those are three very, very good examples that you uh, mitigating those risks can help the brain and the heart. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. So thank you for explaining those three. And just let's dive in, double click into APOE for, for a minute here. And so it appears that there's different variations, different copies of genes that people have from both of their parents with the APOE. And there's an E2 and an E3 and an E4, but uh, there is one, I believe it's an E4 that's in a small percentage of the population that seems to be contributing negatively towards uh, dementia quite significantly. And so uh, how does even, how do people even find out? Is this a 23andMe kind of test or is this a blood test for the APOE? Yeah, so uh, great uh, uh, thought. The fact is that you can actually get your APOE through 23andMe. And when you send your uh, saliva to Boston to get your blood, your, your panel, that one of the things they run is the APOE genotype. Uh, uh, but it's also a commercially available blood test uh, through Quest and lab cords called the Cardio IQ test. It's a very easily accessible and available uh, a test. We do not recommend testing of people who don't have symptoms. So people who don't have symptoms should not be getting tested, at least as the official recommendations. Mm -hmm. Is it kind of like similar to APOB where you only have to test it one time and if you're at risk factor, then you got to do something about it at some point in your life. And if you're not at risk, then you can ignore APOE pretty much for the rest of your life. That's correct. Uh, okay. So APOE would fall in the same category. And it's uh, so APOB is one of the apolipoproteins, APOA, APOB, APOE, APOJ. Uh, but whereas in some of the apolipoproteins, we would test the level. In the APOE genotype, we would test the gene uh, allele frequency, twos, threes, or fours. Mm -hmm. And fours seem to be the worst for APOE, at least. Clearly, clearly. Okay. For, if you have a double copy, meaning homozygote means from inherited from both parents, your lifetime risk for developing Alzheimer's is 18x, 18 uh, fold higher than the general population and a 91% lifetime risk. And if you're a heterozygote, that's about three to four times higher risk than the general population. Holy smokes. Did you just say 18x, 18 yes, times? If you're a homozygote. If you're a homozygote, yeah. My goodness. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. And so yeah. with, with such uh I guess such a risk factor going against you are there, and we'll talk about these ways, but if you do the collective of what the recommendations are to reduce your risk factors for Alzheimer's, can you overcome this genetic predisposition? 
Yeah, this is a really critical question that we're trying to understand. So fortunately, homozygous, meaning two copies of ApoE4, does not represent a huge percent of the population, only 2% of the general population. The heterozygotes represent 20% of the population. In Alzheimer's dementia or Alzheimer's disease, we know we're representing 60 to 65% of all uh, Alzheimer's patients are an ApoE4 carrier. So, uh, and up to 10 to 20% of them are homozygotes. So uh, you're asking a critical question. Can I use some intervention, lifestyle or otherwise, to offset the genetic risk? And that is a question that is being actively explored and investigated and debated in the field. And we're not quite sure there yet, but the logical things that I assume we're going to talk about today Mm -hmm. could be good to offset since they do have benefits in genetic subtypes. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Before we get into some of the recommendations to improve these risk factors, you touched on the other two risk factors or things that we should be doing, and these are hypertension and homocysteine levels. So homocysteine in particular gets high if you're eating a lot of red meat. And like you said, you can reduce it with uh, B vitamins and even trimethylglycine. I've seen some reports where you can reduce it. But what's, if you would, explain homocysteine to the audience or to the listeners for a couple of minutes and, and what you see as in the relation with heart disease and Alzheimer's. Yes, yeah, so hom- hyperhomocysteine uh, anemia, meaning elevated blood cysteine levels, homocysteine levels ha- actually can be easily attracted. It's an easy test to get. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the average range you want for normal would be below 10, uh, ideally below 8. Uh, what we've seen a lot of people 15 to 18 in the Alzheimer's range, and we know about 20, the risk of heart attack and stroke is considerable. And the question is, is it a pro-inflammatory condition? Is it a coagulable condition or uh, something else? So we do know that homocysteine elevations are not good uh, for the vasculature, for sure. Mm -hmm. And is that a test? I don't recall, but is that a test when you go to your practitioner once a year or once every two, or I guess twice a year, whatever you do, is that a test that they regularly test you for, or is that something you have to ask them for, homocysteine? They do not regularly routinely test for you, but it's easily available. It's, I mean, they can add it. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of panels that I uh, draw tend to add the homocysteine, but it is not a rare test. It can easily be gotten. Got it. Okay, so the APOE and homocysteine, you can get them. They're not rare. They're easy. They're not expensive. But you've got to ask your doctor or if you're at risk factors or they can see that you might have some of the risk factors for uh, heart disease or dementia or Alzheimer's, then they might recommend the test themselves. Yes. And uh, so we know that there are, how do I say, panels like uh, cardiac risk panels, uh, what are used to be known as advanced lipid panels. Those will have ApoB, ApoE and homocysteine in them. Hmm. Uh, uh, otherwise, they you don't, uh, but they're cardio IQ. There's a lot of different panels that have the homocysteine and ApoE. There's not that hard to get. Okay. Okay. Let's touch on the third item you mentioned, which is hypertension. And of course, this is pretty common in the population. I believe the numbers I believe in your book were 60% of people might have hypertension at a certain age, middle age and beyond, which yeah. the num- numbers are shocking by the way. And uh, it, it gets worse every year. And so right. what's, what, Dr. Saba, what's causing the hypertension? Is it manifesting differently in men versus women? Yeah, so we know how prevalent hypertension is. Up to 60 million people in the United States have hypertension. Hmm. We know that there is a huge overlap between hypertension and obesity, hypertension and metabolic syndrome, uh, uh, and uh, maybe... Not, not as strong as we used to think that there are diet and hypertension. Uh, you know, we used to just say that if you cut your so- sodium intake, that would be enough. And th- certainly that can help, but that doesn't turn out to be the whole story. So there's a lot more complexity to it. But hypertension is very pervasive. It has significant uh, uh, f- uh, impar- uh, devastating effects to the body, right? So in the mm-hmm. heart, you get cardiomyopathy. So you get vascular resistance from hypertension, which reduces the blood flow to the cardiac muscle, which puts you at risk for ischemic cardiomyopathy, or the heart literally thickens and pumps harder 
and then uh, uh, that can cause ischemia. Uh, the other thing, of course, you get is uh, has hypertension nephropathy, where you start to damage the kidneys because the, the circulation in the kidneys starts to go down. And then, of course, we talk about risk of stroke, a particular kind of stroke called a lacunar stroke. It mm -hmm. increases uh, when you have very, very high blood pressure. And you know it's very prevalent, uh, particularly as you get older. Yeah, totally. And I was reading some statistic where it said that even high levels of chronic stress will shrink or your your arteries are going to constrict, which is going to reduce the blood flow going to your heart and or your, your kidneys and your brain as well. So we'll talk about stress as we discuss some of the ways to uh, reduce these risk factors, but that was very interesting. Um, okay, so uh, was there, does hypertension also cause uh, the plaques to develop in your arteries, or is that separate, separate mechanism of cholesterol? So uh, the, uh, there's clear evidence that hypertension and cholesterol interact to cause the cholesterol deposition in, in the form of a plaque. And the word plaque is just a general term because we mm -hmm. actually use the term plaque in, uh, in, uh, in Alzheimer's for deposition of proteins in the brain. But the deposition of the cholesterol uh, in the vessels, which is a combination of cholesterol and hypertension, and the protein depositions we see in Alzheimer's in the brain are different processes, but we call them both plaques. So that's unfortunately an, uh, mis uh, a too used, too commonly used uh, a name, uh, mm -hmm. the word plaque. But yes, uh, there's interaction between cholesterol and high blood pressure that causes the uh, deposition in the blood vessel walls. Okay. For high cholesterol and managing lipoproteins, I believe in the heart sphere, there's been this mention of, of statins that can reduce some of these bad factors or reduce the numbers in your bloodstream, which might help your heart. I don't know the latest numbers, but would it be also logical to use statins for the brain then for Alzheimer's? That's a critically important uh, observation. The reason it's an important observation is that your audience will tell you that statins cause my memory issues and the internet hates statins. But in fact, statins are great for the brain. There's lots of evidence suggesting that chronic statin use uh, protects the brain against stroke, protects the brain against the beginning of Alzheimer's changes. And it is quite the opposite of what uh, the internet says. The internet says that, you know, statins are make your memory worse, but in fact, it might be protective. Most people are not aware for us that mm -hmm. in 2009, uh, 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 Pfizer, when they had Lipitor under their patent, uh, atorvastatin, actually uh, had, uh, did a clinical trial for atorvastatin, Lipitor, to treat Alzheimer's disease. It was called the LEAD study, L-E-A-D, all capitals. Mm -hmm. And it showed, and it standed for Lipitor's effect on Alzheimer's dementia. And what it showed is the p-value was 0.08. It almost reached statistical significance. Mm -hmm. Had they enrolled 50 more patients in that trial, today we would be prescribing Lipitor to treat Alzheimer's disease. So slightly underpowered, but uh, uh, that's why it didn't get approval. Uh, but the point is, is that uh, uh, reducing statins is a good thing for the brain, uh, particularly in people who are ApoE4 carriers and high cholesterol and prone to develop dementia. Great. And in the book, Strong Heart, Sharp Mind, Dr. Saba actually lists out the blood uh, biomarkers, the numbers act exactly that you should have or be under for a lot of these conditions that we're talking about. So you can definitely reference these if you read his book, which is very well written, by the way. And so, Dr. Sabal, let's then move on. We talked about hypertension, homocysteine, APOE. We talked about statins. We talked about uh, how else, what else we were going to do uh, in this in this factor. And we also jumped into APOE a little bit and the LLs there. But uh, let's now switch gears and and talk about the recommendations that you have in the book and how we can use some of these factors or some of these lifestyle factors and or others to improve conditions and reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. So where, what might be the first one that you want to talk about? Yes. So for us, I know that you, uh, one thing I've admired about your work is that you anti-aging hacks really advocates that we have a sense of empowerment. And that's the one thing I have to, to start with of all the things I want your audience to understand, which is something you've of course been championing for some time here is that 
the, uh, the solution is not a pill. Uh, it has to be embracing a lifestyle and health changes starting today. Not wait for your old, wait, start now. So of course we start with physical exercise and physical exercise, which is something that every doctor, you know, for us, every doctor, right? When wags our finger and says, go exercise, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, but there's more to it. It's not just circulation. It turns out that physical exercise increases a neurochemical in the brain called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which heals brain cells. And there is now clear evidence that the you know physical exercise is the fastest way to increase BDNF, and that BDNF uh, uh, will to help cellular turnover, help cellular processing, and have an actual regenerative process. So much so that there have actually been clinical trials suggesting that physical exercise is good to actually, people who are sedentary who did physical exercise had 20% improvement on their cognitive tests before and after. And now there's been a clinical trial that will report out next year called the EXERT study, looking at mm -hmm. physical exercise in mild cognitive impairment, uh, looking at as a structured, basically dosed, uh, prescriptive exercise regimen to treat mild cognitive impairment or prodromal Alzheimer's disease. So this physical exercise is not just a spurious one-off, you know, feel-good recommendation. There's actual real science, really, really good science to mm -hmm. promote and recommend uh, physical exercise. Yeah, that's really amazing because not only is it great for reducing your obesity or weight levels and also improving insulin sensitivity in the body, but what you're saying is also very good for the brain. And BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, uh, as you're saying, can help regenerate cells in the brain. Are we talking about regenerating neurons, Dr. Sabah? Uh, the answer is potentially yes. We know that BDNF can help uh, synapses to grow back, mm -hmm. uh, can slow the ap apoptotic cell death cycles and uh, uh, help trafficking within the neurons. Mm. Okay. I guess a follow-on question when we talk about Alzheimer's, a lot of people think about the plaques in the brain caused by beta amyloids. Uh, could you maybe explain uh, what's going on in the brain as far as we know? And I know things are changing recently, but uh, what do we know? What causes Alzheimer's and what's the end result in the brain? So we know that uh, Alzheimer's uh, uh, is, starts with the accumulation of amyloid. Uh, I know a lot of people say the amyloid hypothesis is irrelevant. And the people who say that don't live in my world. Am Amyloid is a protein that is a byproduct of a cleavage of a, a larger protein called amyloid precursor protein, and a certain form of amyloid called 42 amino acid amyloid, which is not normally cleared out of the brain, starts to accumulate. Mm -hmm. And when it starts to accumulate, it starts to aggregate into a monomer, dimer, oligomer, protofibril, fibril, and then a plaque. This is a very dynamic process and that when you get to the oligomeric species, that's when the brain starts to react with microglia activation, inflammation, tau and tangle formation, and excitotoxicity and ultimately neurochemical breakdown. So the, cast, the seminal event that drives everything that leads to the dementia is the actual accumulation of the amyloid. So the dementia is the end of the disease. The mm -hmm. accumulation of the amyloid is the beginning of the disease. But amyloid accumulation does not correlate with clinical progression in the symptomatic phase. Amyloid triggers the downstream things, and what correlates with clinical progression is the accumulation and spread of plaques of tangles. Mm -hmm. So it's important that the biology of, am of Alzheimer's is clearly understood, and we understand now Alzheimer's disease to be a proteinopathy, meaning an accumulation or over-accumulation of amyloid or an underclearance of amyloid, and that these either over-accumulation or underclearance triggers everything else that leads to the dementia. Wow. Thank you for the explanation. How long does it typically take from the first signs of Alzheimer's or the, the proteins in the brain to where you have full-blown dementia or Alzheimer's? This is the thing that people uh, need to be aware of. Uh, uh, th the we know that these proteinopathies, these changes in the brain, the accumulation of amyloids start 20 years wow. before the first day of forgetfulness. So the time, by the time you walk into my clinic, these, uh, uh, these uh, proteins have been accumulating in your brain for up to two decades. So the dementia is, in essence, the end of the disease, not the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
20 years and it's undetected years. because we don't we don't know we don't have good sensors in the brain is there even a mri or a cat scan or something you could do to understand progression of this that yeah. doesn't harm your brain yeah so amyloid is it can be accumulating and it, you won't be able to detect it on cat scan or mri you can do uh, another uh, technology called PET scan. The problem with the PET scan is it involves radiation. It's very, very expensive, and mm -hmm. it's not reimbursed. So we're not routinely doing PET scan as part of our clinical practice. Spinal taps we can now do to detect amyloid or Alzheimer changes, and we will do them selectively. But again, uh, in prevention and preclinical stages, we're not routinely doing spinal taps. Mm -hmm. The future for us, and most people not aware of this, is that we're very, very close. Within the year, within the year, we will have blood tests that will be in the clinic that we can use to detect amyloid and tau, uh, much like we would a PSA for a man or a hemoglobin A1C for a diabetic. So those wow. tests way off in the future, they're coming uh, wow. imminently in the clinic. That is fantastic news. I did not expect to hear this from you. Thank you, Dr. Sabo. Wow. That is, I'm sure that people that are at risk, worried about it, and even younger folks, honestly, like myself, I would go get tested yeah. because the brain I know in the world, in the biohacking world and the health and wellness world that I'm in, it's easy to rejuvenate the body much easier than the brain because the brain is not turning over nearly as much as the body does. So I can go build muscle. I can go lose weight. I can do all kinds of things with biohacks, but the brain is still, still um, a mysterious thing as far as we know. It's a black box, so to speak. So thank you for sharing that. In one year, folks, you will have a test that can detect, uh, did you say beta amyloid in the blood? Uh, yes. Wow. Very, very good. Thank you. Okay. So let's come in, coming back to the movement or exercise that we were talking about as one of the preventative ways, ways we can reduce the onset uh, of these uh, brain uh, diseases, so to speak. So we talked about physical activity, and I believe there's recommendations that you should be doing 150 minutes of exercise, just low uh, intensity exercise over the week or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise over the week. And, you know, I also study uh, the blue zones that where they have uh, populations of people that live routinely over 90, over 100 years old. And there's a lot of movement built into their day, a lot of movement. They're moving around all the time, not like us, we're sitting on, on a desk and typing for eight hours. And then we go to the gym for an hour, 40 minutes, and we kick ass, and then that's it. So what's your perspective on movement and how much exercise we should get as, re as it relates to your research? Right. So clearly, uh, you've summarized it exactly. Uh, we would follow AHA, American Heart Association, guidelines uh, to uh, uh, for 75%, uh, 75 minutes of vigorous exercise. But the Blue Zones conversation is very important, right? So what you're talking about is a phenomenon known as natural movement. Mm -hmm. And the people who build normal natural movement into their daily life. And, you know, we, you, w I know that we're all suddenly obsessed with our step counts. And uh, I have already 7,200 today. Very and good. we track these things. And, and uh, but that's kind of part of the natural movement. Okay. So mm -hmm. when you're talking about natural movement, you're not talking about, you're right, just going, jumping on the, uh, the, uh, exercise bike or the treadmill running and then getting off after 15, 20, 30 minutes. It's, it means that you're constantly moving throughout the day. And believe it or not, you do that, you get your step count up to where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are the kinds of things that we should do in our life. But, you know, the way we structure our life, at least in this country, that's not that easy to do, right? We right. get up, we drive in our car to our work where we sit and then when we're done sitting, we drive in our car and go home. Uh, right. There is not our, our environment, our society uh, does not, uh, and except for a few standard cities in the country, we don't naturally have natural movement as part of our life. Mm -hmm. I always tell people, especially after they eat a meal, because glucose control is so important when it comes to anti-aging and longevity and how glucose, excess glucose can attack collagen and age you faster, basically. So I tell a lot of people when I talk to them, after a meal, you got to take a 10 or 15 minute walk. You must. Yeah. 
because it reduces your glucose, also gets your steps in, gets the exercise moving, gets blood flow going. So there's so many advantages. And it's simple. Just finish your meal, take a 10-minute walk, right? It's not, you're not going out of your day to to do something tough. It's just part of the movement that we do every day. Okay, yep. let's move on. You've also, another, some concept from Blue Zones, but I guess a little bit different, but you talk about the Medi- Mediterranean diet and how that's your favorite when it comes to uh, nutrition, especially for a healthy brain. So tell us about that. And also you mentioned that there's different versions of the Mediterranean diet. Which one is the best in your opinion? Yeah. So there's a lot of discussion about diet and everybody wants to say their diet is the best diet, but the Mediterranean diet has been studied for risk reduction. I want to be very clear that I look at symptomatic uh, approaches and risk reduction approaches, meaning prevention and treatment differently. So Mm -hmm. in of risk reduction, the best data is in the Mediterranean diet, which of course is olive oil, fish, legumes, whole grains, just a splash of red wine. Uh, And there's been studied and it's been studied a lot and clearly showing it has benefits. People think that the Mediterranean diet is an epiphenomenon of the Mediterranean, like really has nothing to do with the diet, it has to do with the fact that you live around the Mediterranean, but it was studied in New York City. And so the people who adhere to the Mediterranean diet did have risk of reducing uh, risk reduction for developing Alzheimer's disease. There's a couple of approaches, that particularly if you look at the Sprint Mind study showing the combination of blood pressure management with the Mediterranean diet. So uh, uh, that's where we're at. Now, people always say, what about keto and th- things like that? I think if you have symptomatic dementia, keto might make sense. But do you understand this for us? You're either going all in or not at all. Either you're saying, I'm going full in on the keto or you're not going in at all. You can't have your coconut oil and cookies at the same time that your brain and your body just doesn't work that way. So uh, I would tell you that the best evidence is around the Mediterranean diet for prevention or risk reduction. Mm -hmm. Great. And it's an easy diet to follow. It's not that complicated. You don't have to drastically cut your carbs. It's not all fat or all red meat or what have you. It's it's pretty balanced and you can do that. The only challenge I guess some people have is they might get bloating with some of the lentils or legumes. And uh, I think a lot of people now eat beans because Mexican food is quite popular in the United States. Uh, and so that shouldn't be a problem as much, but if you do, you can soak them. I soak, I eat lentils and I soak them overnight all the time. And so all the anti-nutrients can be sucked out and and, and be gone if you soak it and just uh, drain it a few times and rinse it. So it's easy. Uh, all right, let's move on. You also touch on the importance of good sleep for, for a healthy brain. I think everybody knows this, but I would love your commentary on this one as well. This is a super important concept, and most people not actually ever think about sleep and brain health, but it, the convergence of data around this has really, really taken off mm-hmm. and in a very, very critical way. We know that we clear amyloid in uh, when we're sleeping and that some people think that inefficient sleep can actually accelerate, accelerate accumulation and deposition of amyloid. So much so that we would recommend uh, uh, a good sleep regimen as a way of improving your brain health. Uh, sleep mm-hmm. apnea is disastrous for the brain, increases risk for memory loss, increases risk for stroke. Uh, and it's just bad for you. So if you have sleep apnea, you need to get that treated and treated aggressively. But people do not appreciate that one of the fastest and easiest ways to improve your brain health is to improve your sleep. And so put away your devices, set your clock, go to bed at the same time every night, wake up at the same time every morning, uh, try to not put electronic devices in front of your face right before you go to sleep. Uh, t- turn off your electronics so don't put the TV in front of you. There's so many things you can do to reduce your risks uh, and improve your quality of sleep. And, and that has general brain health. Mm-hmm. Agreed. And we've talked about sleep a lot on this podcast. So everybody, all the listeners should be well aware of that. Okay, let's talk about the next one, which is stress management. And there is one statistic, which I suspected, but it kind of blew me away when I read it in your book. And the statistic was that Some experts suggest that 75% of diseases and unhealthy conditions are linked to chronic stress. Wow. I didn't think the number would be that high, but that's really surprising. And so what are you seeing when it comes to stress and relation to brain health? 
Yeah. This is an area that's getting a lot of attention and focus. We know that stress increases risks of cortisol. Mm -hmm. Cortisol, chronic elevation of cortisol, is just bad for your health in general. We also know that cortisol level chronically elevated disrupts your sleep. So there's a lot of reasons why it's bad for you. Cortisol chronically elevated is a pro-inflammatory phenomenon. Uh, and we know that if we reduce cortisol, we can actually improve a lot of things, including sleep. So there's a lot of reasons to do risk reduction. For us, I think I'm going to guess I'm a little older than you. But in my 50s, I started meditating. I never meditated. Wow. You know, it was a badge of honor mm -hmm. to be stressed out. Like it's like I'm tough, you know, because I'm stressed out. And mm -hmm. I'm now looking at life very differently. I'm like, wait a minute, that's not good for me. And that's why I'm now doing things like meditation in ways I didn't do before. What's your meditation protocol look like? How long do you do it? An app. And it starts It starts about 10 minutes on average, uh, maybe okay. 15, 20, depending on what app I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Easy enough. Anybody can do that for 10 or 20 minutes. Yeah. Your brain is worth it. Uh, okay. Let's move on to the next item, which is cognitive stimulation or COGSTEM to jumpstart your brain. What's the data behind this and how should people be doing it? Yeah, so the National Academy of Science, Medicine, and Engineering published a report in 2017 suggesting that if you did three things, you can reduce, improve your brain health. That is physical exercise, blood pressure management, and cognitive stimulation. So anything that you can think of as a cognitive stimulation is good for your brain, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Sudoku, crossword puzzles. Uh, um, there was a study in China of mahjong. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and, but th what they showed is that people who uh, did cog stem did better than do that didn't do cog stem. Mm -hmm. What we don't know for us is if I do three hours as of Sudoku as opposed to one hour of Sudoku, am I three times more protected? We don't know the answer to that. If I do the New York Times crossword puzzle as opposed to the Sun City, Arizona crossword puzzle, am I in an intensity effect? Am I more protected? We don't know the answer to that. Uh, so what mm -hmm. I'm saying is a lot of data is very kind of squishy about, you know, how, why is it protected? The apps are very popular. The, you know, uh, we, there's a lot of different apps you can do for cog stim. We know that when you do them, they improve those specific areas, whether it's attention and concentration, but it doesn't have a pervasive effect on your brain. It's not like if I do a, a concentration or uh, attention related task that every aspect of my brain health gets better. Just the areas that are being trained get better and it doesn't, and it erodes after time. So doing it, whether whatever app or whatever you do, it's not like it stays on forever. It decays. So if you stop doing it about a month or two later, you're back to where you started. So you have to do it on a continuous basis. There is no one prescription. Like it has to be something like, for example, I am reading four books. That's my cog stem is I have to read four books at the same time. Uh, but I can't do Sudoku to save my life. Yeah, yeah. you know, Sudoku, I'm in trouble. So <laughs> everybody has to do what they like. They have to yeah. do what they like, what they're willing to do, what they're, they're willing to pay attention to. So there's a lot to, lot to think about. Mm -hmm. Totally. I think you hit it on the mark. With exercise, we've got good protocols to say, do this for 150 minutes, do this for 75 minutes, do resistance training, do cardio, do hit exercises. But with the brain, you're saying, not only with the length of time, but also the intensity of the exercise, there's not much data on what's the ideal, I guess, minimum effective dose uh, that might be worth it for most people to do. But I guess what you're saying is just do it. Do it every single or do it as much as you can, things that you enjoy. Uh, I actually signed up for one of those apps last year and I thought, oh, I'm going to improve my brain. And then I started looking at research and like, okay, I gave them my money, but let me find some research and studies. I couldn't find anything that directly related to long-term improvement in brain health. And so after a while, of course, I stopped, but I enjoyed doing them for a little while. It was fun. Yeah. Uh, okay, got it. Let's move on to the next thing. Again, this is also emphasized in the blue zones, uh, the social connections. And I, I think in the less developed world, Dr. Sabah, it's it's accepted and that's the norm. You're hanging around family, there's bigger families and everybody meets almost every day, if not multiple times a week. And here in the States where we're all go, 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 and the families are smaller and everybody lives far away and we make jokes about the in-laws, it seems like there's more separation and um, more isolation for us. So how is how are social connections so important for brain health? Yeah. 
This is an area that, again, needs more interest, but clearly there's, uh, or investigation, but clearly there's uh, growing investigate interest in seeing it. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you actually, as you know from the Blue Zones, the number one thing that people uh, can do to help their health overall, longevity, is social connectedness, social networks, social integration, and the networks of friends. And this is something you cannot underestimate or overestimate. We also know that social uh, networks uh, reduce isolation, reduce depression, reduce loneliness. I always uh, joke that uh, I hopefully will be part of something that leads to the cure of Alzheimer's. I'm not sure we'll get to the cure, but at least uh, uh, a terminal, uh, changing it from a terminal disease to a chronic disease. And we'll do that in the very near future. But the idea uh, that I can't fix is the loneliness that I see in so many older people. They become widows, their friends die, their friends move, and then they start to get more and more isolated. So, and uh, we can't, we have to cure that. Uh, uh, that social networking can be such a, a powerful thing that we can improve upon in our lives. So, uh, I think that uh, we underestimate the power uh, and the importance of social connectedness, but it is critical. Mm, yeah, very good points there. Uh, and then the next one, I guess is the positive mental attitude that you mentioned. And yeah. uh, so talk to us about that. Yes. Yeah, so people, who, this is an area that's getting, we've always kind of had a visceral feeling that positive attitudes are good. Finally, as you can see for us, people are actually studying it. They're actually doing research on it. And there's actually a study of happy psychology, right? And it shows that if, uh, positive attitudes, people have less disease less depression, more connections. And uh, so there's a lot of growing interest in what's called positive psychology. And uh, we will see more and more reports out of it. Yeah, that's great. And so those are some really good tips that you can use today. There's not complicated. You don't have to spend a bunch of money. They're all available to you right now for very, very cheap or free that you can use to reduce your risk of, of developing Alzheimer's, even if uh, your genetics are are against you, so to speak, with the APOE uh, four allele there. Um, okay, so I was going to ask you this. You kind of answered, but maybe a little bit more uh, on where are we going with Alzheimer's research? Where are we now? You're saying we can convert it from a uh, to a more of a chronic disease, which can be managed at some level. But what are the long term uh, scientific advances showing us? Are we ever going to cure it? in this in the next 20 30 50 years yeah i don't know that cure is in our future cure means you remove disease out of the brain as if it were never there but if it's taking 20 years before you come in the door with your symptoms uh i uh you know that means your pathology has been accumulating Mm -hmm. i think we will convert it to a chronic disease much like we did hiv diabetes multiple sclerosis so we can do that i think that's occurring right now I think we're going to have blood tests that will not only be used for screening, uh, for detection, but for screening. And we will be able to estimate lifetime risks. And then the third wave of the future is prevention. And there's now a big bunch of initiatives around the idea that we would identify people at risk and then intervene before they have symptoms. And so there's a big interest in prevention research. Ah, uh, And so converting it from what it is now to more of a chronic condition, uh, is that going to be managed through a medication? Because the rec- the recommendations we have gone through are all on the individual. The onus is on me to improve the state of mind and to do a positive mental attitude and all these other things, exercise. But are you saying that to convert it to a chronic disease would be more of a medication that I take? It would be a lot of things. It would be both combination of medications and lifestyle changes. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be just one thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Man, uh, I know a lot of people in the longevity world are super excited that there are some big advancements coming with age reversal this decade, and certainly a lot more in the next decade. But I think the final frontier, as you're pointing out, is the brain, because we just don't know enough. Um, And that might be the limiting factor that we may not be able to get through, uh, overcome in the short term. If it's chronic, I guess you could get on with it for a while, but uh, eventually that's what's going to get you, huh? Yeah. We, uh, we want to, you know, the longevity world, uh, your area clearly of expertise, 
we want those years to be good and high quality and enjoyable. And the number one existential threat that people don't really appreciate is not frailty, although frailty would probably be too, is Alzheimer's. And the existential threat that robs the possibility of having a high quality of life is your cognitive loss. So that's why this convergence of interest is not an accidental one. Mm -hmm. And it's, I'm so glad you are leading a lot of the research in this area, Dr. Sabah, and now you're finding new connections, especially with the heart and how that impacts the brain. And I'm excited to see where the research goes. I'm super excited to uh, look at the blood test when it comes out and get one for myself and advise everybody that I know to go get it as quickly as possible. Um, yeah. What are next steps for you? What are you working on currently? So I have uh, three grants that are looking at drugs repurposed to treat Alzheimer's disease or pre-Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment. So one, two, two grants which are looking at a cancer drug called lenalidomide. And then we're looking at multiple sclerosis drugs. That's just on the current docket of, of work, but we have other grants that we're going to put in. So we want to look for uh, tests uh, of, uh, of a variety of different things. So a lot of things to on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Great. Where can people that are listening to this podcast find you or look you up or find more information about you? Or yeah. even are you, look, are you working with patients directly? Oh, yes, I still see patients uh, 20 to 30% of my time. Okay. I'm professor of neurology at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, you just look up Barrow, B-A-R-R-O-W, uh, Neurological Institute, and you can find me quite easily. Or you can just Google me, Marwan Sabah, and you'll find me quite easily. And you can find me also on Amazon, and I have my seven books on Amazon. Uh, so I'm hopefully pretty easy to find at this point. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so folks, there you have it. Great interview, uh, great recommendation. So please follow these and best, best of all, read the book. It will give you a lot more detail than we were able to get into in this interview. But that's it, Dr. Sabah. Thank you so much for coming on the Anti-Aging Hacks Show. Thank you very much. 